Hey there, welcome back to the channel. So, you just clicked on a video with the title Harry Potter and the Chamber of Collocates. All I can really say to that is uh, five points to Hufflepuff. Congratulations. There are two things that I want to talk about in this video. First of all, I'll talk about the Harry Potter corpus, which is not a regular corpus. It's very unlike the corpora that we've been using up to this point, like the British National Corpus. It doesn't have any annotation, it doesn't have any tagging, it's not been controlled in terms of its composition, so very different. And the point here is to show you that you can actually perform corpus linguistic analyses with data that wasn't supposed to be a corpus in the first place. Okay, And that's what we're going to do in the second part of the video, where we are going to enter the chamber of collocates. Right. So let's talk about the Harry Potter corpus. Um, if you're my student, you can download it from the Moodle page. If you're not my student, there is a link in the description below where you can leave your email address and I will send it to you. Okay, I'll check regularly whether someone left their email. Right, um, so once you have the files, I would ask you to open up AntConc and load all the corpus files into and conk. And you see um, there are seven corpus files, one for each novel. Okay. And uh, in order to perform some analyses with that data, we need to adjust a few settings. So first thing I would like you to do is to load in a reference corpus. If you have, please use the BNCA files. Um, so the way to do it is to go to settings, tool preferences, uh, keyword list, and then here, leave all those settings in place, add a directory, and that would, uh, you would navigate to the BNCA files. Here they are, yeah, they appear. You load them into the tool, you hit apply, and uh, that should mean that the reference corpus is loaded. If you don't have the BNC, you know, take another corpus that you have lying around. If you don't have any corpus lying around, uh, you can skip this step. Uh, step. That's, that's fine too. Second setting that I'd like you to adjust is uh, in the concordance category. So settings, tool preferences, concordance. Please check this checkbox here. Put delimiter around hits in the keyword and context display. Again, hit apply and you should be good to go. So let's do some corpus linguistic analysis of Harry Potter novels. Um, okay, uh, first thing I would like us to do is to go to the word list tool. So click on that writer and uh, the search term window can stay empty. All the settings here can stay the way you find them. Just hit start and there is a list of keywords that should appear here. And it starts with some usual suspects like the and to off. But you notice that there are some elements in here that we don't usually see, like Harry, he, said, okay? Those are not normally among the most frequent elements that we find in a regular Purpose. So that already tells you something about the kind of data that we're working with here. Um, but of course, what makes this corpus special comes out a lot more clearly when we're using the keyword tool. Okay, so do me a favor, click on the keyword list tool. <clears throat> um, now, our reference corpus is fully loaded. Okay, if you don't have a reference corpus in Ancon, this won't work, uh, but uh, if you have some reference corpus loaded in, this should work just fine. Um, again, you can leave all of these settings as they are. The search window can stay empty. Just hit start, and if you do that, uh, there's a list of keywords with keyness ratings and everything that should appear. <clears throat> And, uh, well, this uh, list, well, no surprises really. Harry and he come out on top. We have Ron, Hermione, Dumbledore, and if you scroll down, you find all the Harry Potter characters. Uh, they appear here. They're not usually part of a normal corpus. 
and so that's why we find them. But also things like said, okay? So there are lots of representations of speech where people talk to one another and there's an utterance and then said Harry or said Dumbledore. Okay, and that's why we have said up here. Um, yeah. One more thing that uh, I forgot to tell you. So in the wordless tool, if we go back to that just for a second, there's one more useful thing, uh, namely the tool gives us the overall number of word tokens we have. 1,121,774 words in the corpus. So roughly a 1 million word corpus. Um, that's good to know. And it also gives us the type frequency, so the different words that we find in the corpus. In this case, uh, 22,179. Okay, good. So word list, keywords, um, there's one more thing that I want to show you that I haven't been talking about in earlier videos, and that will be the concordance plot. Now, usually the concordance plot, if you take a corpus that's comprised of uh, basically text sausage, yeah, so you have 500 word chunks from different texts, um, this concordance plot tool doesn't really show you anything that would be very interesting. This is interesting when your texts have structure to them, okay? So here we have plots, one for each novel. So first plot would be about the Philosopher's Stone, then we have the Chamber of Secrets, the Prisoner of Azkaban, and so on and so forth. And uh, the way you have to read these plots is that each plot is a horizontal line of words. Okay, so first word, second word, third word, and so on and so forth, until we have the final word. And there are black horizontal uh, vertical lines, yeah? And each line represents a hit of a word or a linguistic unit that you've been searching for. So the lines tell you where in the text a word appears, and where a word appears in uh, a more dense distribution. Yeah? So you see that, uh, okay. Here, for instance, we have a bunch of hits towards the end and uh, one uh, couple of hits towards the beginning and then almost nothing throughout the entire book. Now, what did I search for here? Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you. So, you know, I, I mustn't pronounce this name, uh, but you see how he who must not be named is distributed across the novels, okay? So we see the place where in the novels and the beginning and end theme is kind of a recurring uh, pattern. But you also see that the lines get darker and darker as we progress through the series. So uh, there seems to be a kind of growing importance of uh, that name or at least a heightened prevalence from the beginning towards the end. Interesting, no? Yeah. Okay, uh, concordance plots. I thought I'd throw that in here. We also uh, can look at the clusters and n-grams. So here I specified that I wanted n-grams of uh, a minimum of three words, maximum of three words. Um, I left the minimum frequency at one. You can scale that up and make it a bit more frequent so then the search will not take quite as long. Again, the search term window is empty, but I activated the check box that says n-grams. Okay? So, with all that in place, you can hit start and it will give you the most frequent 3 grams. So, out of the I don't, Ron and Hermione, there was a in front of Harry and Ron, Fred and George. So this shows you both grammatical patterns as well as um, yeah, topical patterns like, okay, so Ron and Hermione, they appear together, Fred and George appear together, and uh, well, that's interesting too, in a way. Okay, let's look at collocates. So um, here I searched for a word that I can pronounce, so I searched for Hagrid and collocates that appear together with that name. And uh, I set the window span from five left to five right. 
minimum call occurred frequency I set to 5, so the stat value here, you remember, is mutual information, which is highly sensitive to low frequencies. <clears throat> Right, uh, and I set the sorting tool to sort by the mutual information statistic. Right, so what does that give us? Um, Hagrid talks with an accent, so we have nothing. Right, that, what, just, yeah? So that's the way he talks. Note there's nothing and nothing. I'll probably pronounce the same. Yeah, but they're rendered orthographically a little different. That could be, um, well, could be, uh, that could have something to do with the different editions. So the uh, American and the British editions of Harry Potter have uh, slight differences. So source, Sorcerer's Stone, Philosopher's Stone, uh, nothing and nothing. You notice that um, British Hagrid lives in a hut, whereas uh, American Hagrid lives in a cabin. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. He's a gamekeeper, though, in both versions of the story. He has a crossbow, you know, kind of a redneck kind of character, speaking in a funny voice. Anywhere. Uh, so one thing that caught my eye here was the word oaf, which I didn't know. So I had to use the concordance tool to figure out what that word meant. Um, so it's a seemingly derogatory term for Hagrid. So the stupid great oaf. <clears throat> uh, this should put an end to the oaf's teaching career, said Malfoy. Hagrid's not an oaf, said Hermione shrilly. Okay, so that's that. Interesting. You can learn things from these data. Let's enter the chamber of collocates. Let's do some actual corpus linguistic analyses with the Harry Potter novels. And uh, there's one question that I would like to address, that I would like us to uh, approach, and that would be the question of who speaks and how. Okay, we already noticed that the verb said appears very frequently in the Harry Potter novels. So that happens in the context where we have an utterance and then a verb that describes the utterance and links it to the speaker. So for example, uh, in uh, sentences like a book said Harry or a couple of people said Harry hoarsely and so on and so forth. We find lots of those, okay? So um, do me a favor, go to the concordance tool Activate the regex checkbox and type in the following here. So um, it will give you this kind of display if your sorting uh, parameters are set in this way. I have mine sorted to first right, second right, third right. And um, what, well, said Harry, that's just two words that we're looking for with white spaces in between. And then here, there's a regular expression that um, I'm sure you can figure out what it does, okay? So why don't you take a minute, pause the video, and figure out what this does. <clears throat> and I will continue now. Uh, so we have double quotation marks to the left and right. So we're looking for an utterance that is framed by double quotation marks. And to find everything inside those quotation marks, we simply look for a sign that is not itself a double quotation mark. Okay, the, uh, the logic is kind of twisted, but it's very efficient. So this little caret in angular brackets means uh, none of the following. Okay, so find me something that is not a double quotation mark. Several of those, okay, between two quotation marks. And that gives you a book question mark it gives you uh, about Siri hyphen hyphen snuffles question mark and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, of course, we uh, want to find, well, not only things that Harry said, but also things that Hermione said. And you can easily, you know, adjust the search pattern to find things that Hermione said 
and that Ron said, and that Malfoy said, and so on and so forth. You can play around with this for a little while. But what we want to do, of course, is that we want to find not only instances of said, but also other verbs that describe how people talk. Okay? So, how do we do that? You can, again, think for a minute. How would you change this kind of uh, regular expression if you wanted to find, uh, for instance, replied or asked or shouted? Yeah? How would you do that? I'm going to continue. Very easy, actually. Yeah? So all you need to do is have uh, A to Z in angular brackets with a plus. So that will find you lowercase letters, a string of lowercase letters uh, between an utterance, separated by double quotation marks, and a name that we specify. Yeah? So when we look at the results that we get from that, we get uh, said Harry, muttered Harry, asked Harry, repeated Harry, and so on and so forth. Gasped is here. There are a couple more. You know, you can scroll down and see all the different kinds of speech act verbs that uh, J.K. Rowling uses. She has a an impressive vocabulary of speech act verbs. And of course, what we're looking for are any interesting differences in the verbs and the frequencies of those verbs with our different protagonists. Okay? So, uh, how often do we find said and muttered for Harry? How often do we find those same verbs for Hermione? Yeah, so here I just changed uh, Harry into Hermione and um, Okay, we have said Cried Breathed Whispered Whispered So people talk differently who would have thought? Yeah. But of course, individual examples only take you so far. What we want to know is whether there are quantitative asymmetries between the verbs that our protagonists use and if those differences are really reliable. Right? So that's what we're going to do now. I would like you to save three concordances. Be sure to activate the regex checkbox if you haven't done so. Be sure to uh, type in these expressions uh, so that they give you 2744 hits for Harry or thereabouts. Okay, so corpus linguistics, in case you haven't noticed, is never 100%, but you can get to 99%. Yeah. Hermione, I found 1,444. For Ron, 1,655. So unsurprisingly, perhaps, Harry gets to talk uh, a lot more. Yeah, <clears throat> Hermione and Ron, sort of similar. Yeah, uh, so please do me a favor. Search for these patterns and then save the concordances somewhere on your computer where you can find them. Give them meaningful labels like said Harry, said Hermione, TXT, something like that. And then, you could see this coming a mile off, uh, we need to import those data into Excel where we can analyze them. Okay, And uh, there's a reason that I'm saying import rather than copy and paste. Copy and paste will do interesting things and not necessarily desirable things to our quotation marks, and we need the quotation marks, okay? So in this case, I take this opportunity to show you a different way of getting data into Excel. Excel has an import function that you find under the menu items uh, data, okay? Again, I'm using my fancy French version of Excel, which has données, much more accurate than data, uh, données externe, Importer un fichier text. That is, uh, it, it means just get data into Excel. And when you click on that, you know, there's a menu that pops up that has several screens that tells you, like, oh, well, this is way important. Yeah, this is really uh, serious business. Um, the first screen looks like this. So we have an importation assistant 
uh, step one out of three. Uh, so <laughs> you, you, you will need your social security number and uh, you know, tax records from the past five years to get data into Excel. Anyway, the text shows up here. Uh, and luckily, there's nothing that you have to do here. So you can just click on Next. Here, there's something that we need to do, OK, in step three out of step two out of three, sorry. Uh, namely, there are text identifiers. And you see uh, one that is being proposed automatically is a double quotation mark. That we need to avoid at all costs, OK? So we need to check nothing instead of the double quotation mark. And um, so ordinarily, what you can do here is to select the delimiter. Do you want tabs? Do you have uh, semicolons, commas? whatever, yeah, white spaces. Um, anyway, what we're concerned with here is this right-hand uh, panel, and we need to set it to nothing. Hit Next, and that should uh, give us what you see here, OK? A display of data with the number of the example, the left context, the search term, that is the utterance, uh, Albania repeated Harry. Okay, so utterance, verb, name of the speaker, and then the right context and the corpus file. So you can see this on the screen, but there's prisoner of Azkaban, sorcerer's stone, and so on and so forth. Right, okay, so supposing that all of this has gone to plan, we still need to isolate the verb. Okay, right now we have a column with the utterance, the verb, and the name. And if you've watched the uh, videos on colostructional analysis, you already have an inkling of what we're going to do here in order to isolate the verb. We're going to use the uh, search and replace function that Excel kindly provides. And uh, one operation takes care of the utterance, yeah, double quotation marks. And then in between question mark star finds any and all signs in between the quotation marks. We replace that with nothing. We replace everything. And boom, all the quotations are gone. Then we replace Harry with nothing. I'm sure there's a name for like a magic spell that does that. Uh, but I have to confess I'm not enough of a fan, really. Uh, I've read those books, yeah. But... In order to learn French, when we moved to Switzerland, I, I had those books, and uh, so I, I knew all those French words for magic wand and turtle and, uh, yeah, was fun, though, was fun. Okay, back to corpus linguistics. Um, when you do this, this should leave you with a uh, column where you have just the verbs, okay? Attention, there might be white spaces to the left and right. So what I do recommend is that you actually perform a third or a fourth search and replace where you search for white spaces and replace those. Yeah. Okay, so in this case here, just the verbs are left and I uh, created a column next to it with the speaker. And you'll see why in just a second. Okay, so... We have each verb, we have the speaker, and now, of course, we need to repeat the procedure of importing the data into Excel and identifying, isolating the verb, creating a column for the speaker for our two other protagonists, Hermione and Ron. This will take a minute or two or 20 or 100. Uh, if you're not used to fiddling around with Excel, yeah, uh, you can either suffer through it or you can download the um, spreadsheet that is available on our Moodle page or in the description below. Uh, and you can compare your own data to the data that's in that Pottermania Excel file. Uh, yeah, do yourself the favor and play around with it for a little bit so that you get a sense for where the problems are and what you can do, what you're struggling with, and so on and so forth. But uh, once you have this, we're actually just one step away from having interesting data to analyze. 
If you've watched the colostructional analysis videos, one thing that's on your mind is, oh my god, not again this thing with recherche V or V lookup, okay, <laughs> where you have frequency lists that you need to merge and to integrate and that is a hot mess that we want to avoid at all costs. For once I have good news for you. Namely, we don't need recherche V. We can uh, just copy and paste these three data sets into one single set of columns and then we can do a pivot table and we're done with the uh, number crunching part of, well, almost. Yeah? Uh, we're done with the data arrangement part, let's say. Okay, so let's try and do that. Uh, so here I combined the verbs and the names. So I started with Harry. So we have 2,700 rows of said Harry, murmured Harry, gasped Harry, and so on and so forth. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. And uh, once you have place left, um, you copy in everything that Hermione said, whispered, shouted, and so on and so forth. And below that, everything that Ron said or asked or muttered. Okay, so that should give you a... Um, total of 5,812 things that Harry, Hermione, and Ron said. So a lot, but not that much. You know, we can deal with it. Um, and once you have that, you can synthesize that data with a pivot table, a tableau croisé dynamique. Excellent. Yeah, so under the data menu item, choose the pivot table and that will take you to a new sheet that looks something like this. And it will not look like this immediately. You have to drag the verb category to the rows, the line. You'll have to drag the speaker to the colon, to the columns, and the verb, one more time, to the values. Okay, And that will make this arrangement of verbs and number uh, appear on the left-hand side of the sheet. And what you see here, for instance, is, uh, okay, asked. Uh, these are the uh, values for Harry. These are the values for Hermione. These are the values for Ron. And these are the grand totals. Okay, so for asked, Harry asked 121 things. Hermione asked 55 questions. And Ron asked 59 questions. And we have a total. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are also blanks in the table that we will fill in, but that's a lot easier than uh, integrating things with recherche and so on and so forth. You just sort, yeah? If you sort after Harry, then all the empty fields are at the bottom. If you do the same for Hermione, again, all the empty fields are either at the top or at the bottom, and you can fill in zeros, and you do the same for Ron. Uh, so, in order to do that, please do me a favor and copy and paste everything from admitted to um, yielded, perhaps. I don't know. We'll have to check what the last verb in the alphabet is. <clears throat> Yawn, I guess. Yeah? But you tell me. You look it up. Right. And what you should have is an arrangement that looks a bit like this. Okay. So, the first four columns here. We have the verbs, we have the frequencies for Harry, we have the frequencies for Hermione, and for Ron. And uh, yeah, so you see that I inserted all the zeros. So this is already after a bit of sorting and filling in and uh, rearranging and so on and so forth. And I sorted these after the combined frequency of the verbs, which is column H. Here. So let me take this bit by bit. Um, next to the first three columns, we have a column with the frequency of all speech acts that Harry is responsible for, 2,733. Those are not all that uh, we started out with, yeah, because there are some false positives that fell by the wayside. <clears throat> Actually, let's look at this. So here we are in the pivot table again, and you notice that there's and in row 24, there's at in 27, there's but 
in 34. So these are things that we want to get rid of. Okay, if you see them, you can just eliminate them. That's not cheating, that's not uh, falsifying your data, it's cleaning up the data. And of course, there's somewhat, you know, there's a line in the sand between cleaning up data and uh, massaging it too much. Okay, so that's our basic data from the pivot table. Here I entered columns for the combined frequencies of speech acts. So Harry said 2,733 things, Hermione said 1,433 things, and Ron 1,646. You can get those numbers just by clicking, highlighting the columns B, C, and D, and asking Excel to sum up the uh, values. In some cases, you don't even have to ask it. It just shows you the number. Right, um, so that's that. I also calculated the grand total for each verb. So uh, B2, C2, and D2 together gives me 5,091 instances of the verb said. Um, that's far and away the most frequent one. That's the neutral way of talking about something that a person uttered. Uh, and then we have asked, whispered, shouted, yelled, snapped, muttered, and so on and so forth. Uh, J.K. Rowling has an impressive vocabulary of more than 200 speech act verbs in the uh, Potter series. And in the final column here, speech acts total, that is just these three cells added up. So E2 plus F2 plus G2 gives us the grand total of utterances. Why am I integrating all these frequencies into this table, you might ask. Well, you may have a terrible premonition, namely that we might use these to calculate expected frequencies and ultimately collocation measures, which is what we're going to do now. Very sorry. So, um, I'm sure you remember watching this video on calculating collocational strength for the first time and thinking, what the hell, yeah? What is this? Um, actually, let me recommend that you go back and uh, watch this video one more time this afternoon or sometime when, you know, you have nothing else to do. And I can promise you that you will look at this and go, oh yeah, I know how to do this, yeah? But now it's, it's totally logical. And if that's the case, five points for Hufflepuff. Right, but let me get back to uh, a quick reminder of how we calculate collocational strength. We have two words, and uh, sometimes we observe them together, so something like pretty well. Yeah? Um, so pretty is word one, well is word two. We observe them together for a certain number of times. We observe uh, pretty alone or in other contexts a certain amount of times. We observe well a bunch of times and we have a total number of words in the corpus. Those are the four cells that allow us to calculate expected frequencies and um, <clears throat> collocational measures such as mutual information, log likelihood, and others that you've seen. So um, when we're doing this kind of logic for speech act verbs and characters. Our logic is the same, but applied in a slightly different way. So instead of word one, we have a speaker, Hermione. Instead of word two, we have a word, whispered. So the four cells now mean different things. Um, the red cell means how often do we find an utterance that is followed by whispered Hermione? How often do we find uh, speech acts that Hermione is responsible for? Yeah. How often do we find whispered being used as a speech act verb? And how many speech acts do we have in the corpus as a whole? Now, I hope that you realize that all of these four cells we actually already have in the spreadsheet. Let me go back a few slides. Here we are. So, how often does Hermione whisper? 39 times, okay. How many speech acts is Hermione responsible for? 1433. How often do people whisper? 
There are 60 speech acts where people whisper. And the final purple cell is the number of speech acts in total, 5,812. Okay, so based on this, we can actually calculate expected frequency. So how often do we expect Hermione to whisper, statistically speaking? Yeah, for that, we uh, need to uh, have these marginal frequencies. Yeah? So the green cell and the blue cell. We multiply those and divide it by the purple marginal cell. Um, so 1433 times 60 divided by 5812. You can do that in your head, right? Uh, okay, five points to half above. Um, I had to do this with a trusty calculator. 14.8. That's not even half of what Hermione whispers. So Hermione is a whisperer, yeah, if you didn't know. Okay, so the way this is calculated, it takes the whole number of speech acts into account. And of those speech acts, uh, 1433 involve Hermione, 60 involve whispering, and, um, well, that gives us the uh, expected frequency. Uh, ignore this, that's a typo left over from a previous presentation. Okay, so uh, in the spreadsheet that comes with this video, I have included the expected frequencies for each verb, for each speaker, and I would invite you to do the same, okay? So try and uh, come up with a formula the formula that gives you 14.79 for Whisper and Hermione <clears throat> and all the others, okay? Let's look at these expected frequencies because there are some interesting observations that we can make. So, for example, I want you to appreciate how eerily close the expected frequencies for said are to the observed ones, okay? So, for Ron, we expect 1,441.81, okay? That's only 1.2 examples away from the actual frequency, 1,443, yeah? Um, Hermione says a few fewer things, and Harry says a few more things, but in the grand scheme of things, it's still very close, uh, expected and observed are very close to each other. And uh, that's a testament to the fact that, okay, everybody says things. Say is a neutral verb that you can use to express uh, that, that someone produced an utterance. There are other verbs that are more asymmetric with regard to observed and expected. Uh, whisper, that's certainly one, yeah. Um, so we expect that Harry whispers 28 times, he whispers only 8 times. Uh, cried. Oh dear. Yeah, you see what's going on. Um, Harry doesn't cry much, Ron doesn't cry at all. Snap. So Harry snaps five times, Hermione 13 times, she's a snapper. Ron snaps nine times. Um, yeah, and we, we expect only 6.66. Oh, um, what's going on there? Yeah, so Hermione snaps a lot more than we would expect by chance. And you already see that there are profiles that emerge, okay? So you can portray a character in terms of how you make them speak, yeah? And to sharpen this even further, let's calculate a measure of collocational strength. And for this purpose, I just picked mutual information. You can also do a log likelihood measure, which would be nice here. But uh, just for the purpose of this video, I stuck with MI. Uh, we're using the same pieces of information how often do we find whispered Hermione? How often does Hermione speak? How often do people whisper? And how often do people talk overall? And we plug these pieces of information into the mutual information formula, and that gives us numbers, okay? So here are the actual frequencies 
plugged into the formula and we get an MI value of 1.4, which may strike you as not particularly high, but uh, we need to look at these values in context in comparison to other values. So we need to compare the verbs against each other, which is um, what you can see in the Excel spreadsheet that I prepared. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at this. So in the columns to the right of the expected frequencies, we have mutual information values for each verb and each speaker. Okay, and uh, here we have mutual information values for said, and you see they're close to zero in each case, meaning that there's nothing much to see here. Said is distributed evenly across our three speakers, but there are others where we have fairly uh, large deviations from zero. So for example, Harry doesn't whisper, Hermione whispers a lot, okay? Uh, what's this? So here Hermione has a really negative uh, MI value that would be yelled, okay? So both Harry and Ron are yellers, yeah? So Harry yelled 17 times, boy, that dude's got issues. Um, Hermione, no, too classy, soft-spoken, no yelling. A lot of snapping, though. Yeah, so Harry definitely under snaps. <clears throat> Mutter, it looks like a big difference, but mutual information says, ah, oh, no. Uh, gasping, okay, Hermione gasps, Ron is an anti-gasper. Now, something that you see here is that in some cells, Excel complains, gives you this uh, error message, which results from a zero. Yeah. So remember, in mutual information, there's a log function that uh, the formula calls. And if there's a zero in there, you can't compute the log. And that's why you get this kind of message here. So uh, Ron cried zero times. That is uh, what... <clears throat> is responsible for this message here. So sometimes we have two characters not using a verb. So for instance here, shriek. So Hermione shrieks nine times. And uh, Harry and Ron, they don't shriek. They're way too manly for that kind of thing, I can tell you. Uh, by contrast, both of them croak. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I guess you can, uh, you know, look through these on your own and um, make a few interesting observations. Uh, one useful thing to do is to sort after mutual information for each character. So here I sorted after uh, Hermione. So her top mutual information values are these here. So Hermione shrieked, squealed, screamed, squeaked, wailed. <laughs> Oh man, you can't make this shit up. Um, but she also concludes and explains, intones, <laughs> screeched, sniffed, sobbed. Yeah, okay. And of course down here is cried, okay? This will be actually the first where we have an instance of a verb that is also used by someone else. So, okay, Harry cried once in the series. Um, Whisper is down here, yeah. You can imagine if you take a different uh, collocational measure, this would come out way more on top because, well, mutual information, of course, is sensitive to these one-offs, okay? But in this case, actually, it shows you something, okay? Right, 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 right. Um, here, I sorted after Ron. What's Ron up to? Well, he grumbles, shrugs, barks, chortles, guffawed, uh, yeah, spat, snorted, snarled, croaked. Interesting. Well, okay. So part of why I find this interesting is that when I read the book, it didn't strike me as, you know, I, this, these asymmetries, they didn't jump out at me. I thought, yeah, well, these are just normal people 
and they're behaving in a normal way. But I mean, that's part of why, why literature is interesting. It can, you know, give you an impression and you don't reflect all parts of that reflection necessarily. Okay, there we go. Um, I would like you to do something, okay? So now that you've seen one example of how you can analyze Potter data, why don't you go ahead and do something for yourself? I would like to know, what do Harry, Hermione, and Ron do? So again, that uh, requires you to perform searches and save concordances. And um, yeah, I wanted to take something very simple. Let's just look at past tense verbs that follow the three names of our protagonists. So A to Z plus ED. That gives us regular past tense forms, not the irregular ones. So shook, sang, uh, that doesn't happen. Also, not all past regular past tenses end with ed. Some have just a d. <clears throat> yeah, so it, it gives you a subset of what happens. Not everything that happens, but that's fine. Okay, for all purposes, that's fine. Um, these search patterns should have a white space at the end. Otherwise, you get things that have an ed in the middle of the word. That's not what you want. Import your results into Excel. Compare observed and expected frequencies. Identify the most typical verbs for each character. And uh, let me know what you find, Yeah, because um, I suspect there might be cool things going on. All right, that's it for today. Have fun with um, <clears throat> these uh, data and um, who knows, you might gain a lot of points for your house if you do this. Not from me though. All right, that's it. Um, here is just a first glimpse at a concordance of things that Hermione did. So she accepted his story, she agreed, she allowed Travers she answered, she approached, she argued, she arrived, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this works. I'm sure there are some false positives and, of course, lots of uh, false negatives, things that you, you, you don't find. But, uh, yeah, we deal with that. We accept that for the time being. That's it for now. Have a good week, and I'll talk to you later.